ahead and open your Bibles to James, book of James. Kind of near, near the back, if you're not familiar with how the, the uh, books of the Bible are ordered, it's kind of near the back, right? After Hebrews. You know, authenticity is, has become kind of one of the buzzwords in our culture, hasn't it? Uh, surveys tell us that one of the most important values for Gen Z is authenticity. But what really is authenticity? How do you know when something is authentic? Well, with some things, it's not that hard. I guess, you know, with, with stuff, for products, it, you know, you look for a particular logo or you look for a brand name. And maybe that tells you that it's authentic. For artwork, you look for the artist's signature somewhere you know, on the painting or on the sculpture or whatever. A little easier with things that are tangible like that. For things that are intangible, how do you know when things are authentic? It's a lot harder. You can't touch them, right? Like, for example, emotions. Emotions can easily be faked. People can pretend to be loyal. People can pretend to be friends. How do you know when these things are authentic? We... We want authentic emotions, right? We want authentic friendship. How do we know when they're authentic? But I'm not talking about those things today. We're talking actually about faith. Authenticity of faith. Authenticity in our faith is even more important than even any of those other intangible things that I talked about. Why? Because we are saved by grace through faith. Faith is like the lifeline that keeps us from falling to our destruction. We need to know whether that faith is real. Like if you're climbing a cliff and you're entrusting your entire life to that rope well, then you better know that that's an authentic climbing rope, not just a homemade piece of twine, right? The problem is, there's, when it comes to faith, there's a lot of counterfeits. There are people that think they have faith, but their faith is not the real deal. And then there's other people who claim to have faith, but even they know it's not real, and it's a front. But we need to have real, authentic faith. And so we need to know what authentic faith looks like, right? And that's what brings us to the book of James. Because James exhorts us to an authentic faith. And that's going to be the overall theme of the book. And so that's why I've titled this series, as we study through the book of James, Authentic Faith. I have to say that after I decided that title, I then looked around and found out how many other preachers had titled their series through James, Authentic Faith. And I was like, oh, well, that's a little bit too cliche. I don't know if I should do that, but then it's an appropriate title. The reason all those other preachers titled it that is that's what the book is about. It's about authentic faith. And as we're going to see, James shows us that authentic faith is demonstrated by outward actions. It's not just an empty feeling in our heart. It's not just empty words. It's things that are shown in how we act. Because the, you know, the true state of the heart is not something we can see. Uh, Rather, it's shown on the outside through what we do. In fact, throughout Scripture, we're told that our heart is shown in our outward actions, right? The Israelites were rebuked because they claimed to worship God, but at the same time, they were, they were oppressing the vulnerable people within their society. Jesus tells us that the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. In other words, how you talk uh, demonstrates the state of your heart. In, in Jesus' description of the final judgment at the, the throne in the, in the final day, he said that how you treat the least of these, in other words, how you, how you treat the, most, the followers of Christ, the most vulnerable ones, is a demonstration of how you love Jesus. And the Apostle John says in 1 John 4.20, if anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So what all these are saying, as you see throughout the, the, the trend of Scripture, is that the truth of our love towards God, the truth of our faith towards God is demonstrated in what we do towards other people and how we act towards other people, how we, we act uh, on the outside. And so that's the burden that James has in this letter. It, he's trying to get us to demonstrate our faith through, the, through our actions towards people. So you can already tell this is going to be a really practical study as we go through the book of James. It's going to help us develop our faith. It's going to help us demonstrate our faith and our love in practical ways. And we're going to start off as we get into this book, I, like I do when we start these books, I want to give you a kind of a background. We're going to start with kind of getting to know about, a little about the man who wrote this. This was a letter. 
the man who wrote the letter, who he wrote it to, kind of the occasion that brought about the writing of the letter. And this should help us understand the letter better. Now, the letter from James starts off with a standard greeting. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. Greetings. So we see that the author identifies himself as James. So the first question we have to ask is, which James? I mean, James, or in Hebrew it would be Jacob, is a, was a common name in, the, in that day. It's kind of like John nowadays or, or something like that. It's a, it's a common name. And so for the author just to say his name without any further identification, like James the son of or James of whatever town or whatever like that, for him to say that just James had to be someone who was so well known that the church would know who this is coming from and they would recognize it as being coming with authority and, and that they would pay attention to the letter. So which James could it be? Well, there's at least three James spoken of in the Gospels who were fairly well known. Two of those were members of the 12 disciples that were chosen by Jesus. First of all, there was James, who, along with his brother John, were sons of Zebedee, right? And they were part of that three people in the inner circle around Jesus, Peter, James, and John. But this couldn't have been written by that James because he was executed by Herod Agrippa very early after Jesus ascended into heaven. And that would have, this letter would not likely have been written that early before he was executed. So... Probably not that James, the son of Zebedee. Another disciple of the twelve was James, the son of Alphaeus. Or it, it might be the same as one we see in other Gospels named James the Less or James the Younger, depending on how it's translated. This was a fairly obscure disciple. His name only comes up in the lists of names of the twelve disciples. That's the only place he's mentioned anywhere in the Gospels. So it's, he was not really well known enough to call himself just James without any further qualifiers, like son of Alphaeus or something like that. So very unlikely that it was that James either. So the, really the only James who is so well known that he could just say James, the only one is the, the mo and the most likely author of this book is James, the brother of Jesus, or the half-brother of Jesus. So if you don't know, Jesus had four brothers. Uh, Matthew 13 uh, tells us that this is the people of Nazareth were surprised when Jesus came and preached there. It surprised at his wisdom, his miraculous power. And they said, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, aren't they all with us? So where does he get all these things? So Mary and Joseph had four sons and several daughters after Jesus was born. So just as an aside, obviously the Roman Catholic doctrine of Mary's perpetual virginity is not right, is not correct. Um, so of those four brothers of Jesus, we only, the only ones we hear of later after this is James and Judas. Judas is believed to be the one who wrote the book of Jude. Um, but interestingly, James and the other brothers of Jesus didn't believe in Jesus during his life on earth. In fact, it says in John 7, verse 5, it says, not even his brothers believed in him. And some of you may remember the the story where Jesus' mother, Mary, and his brothers came to get him because they thought he was out of his mind. They were kind of staging an intervention. We need to save him from himself. They didn't believe in him. But after Jesus' resurrection, he appeared specifically to his brother James. We, get, we have the record of this in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul lists all the people who Jesus appeared to. He appeared to, to Peter, he appeared to the 12, then he appeared to 500 people all at one time. And then in verse 7, it says, then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. So Jesus specifically uh, appeared to his brother James. And James then became a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And although he probably cherished some of the memories that he had of growing up uh, with Jesus as his brother, he now knew that their relationship was no longer defined by their common blood by being brothers of the same mother. You can see his perspective by the way he starts this letter. He says, James, not brother of Jesus, he says, James, a servant, or we could say slave, of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was his Lord. Jesus was one he needed to serve. And then James became a prominent leader in the church in Jerusalem. 
uh, in Acts chapter 12 when Peter uh, was put in prison and then he was let out by an angel and he needed to have someone tell the, the church. He said, tell James and the apostles, James and, and the, the brothers. So it's obvious that he, singled, he was singled out as a leader in the first big church council in Acts chapter 15. Uh, James was the central figure. It seems he's the one who made the final decision about what needed to be done. So James was a central figure in that church. He was also called an apostle. And as an apostle, his ministry was focused on the Jewish Christians in particular. We see this in Galatians chapter 2, verse 9. It says that James and Cephas, or which is another name for Peter, and John were those recognized as pillars in the church. And it says that their ministry was to the circumcised, which is to the Jews, while Paul's ministry was to the Gentiles, the uncircumcised. So it makes sense then that since James' ministry was particularly to the, the Jews, that he wrote this letter, as he says, to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. He wrote it specifically to Jews because the, the 12 tribes is a definite reference to Israelites because that's how the Jews referred to each other. In that day, they would refer to their people as the 12 tribes in the hope that the 12 tribes would one, one day, one more be united as one. So he's writing to Jews, but it wasn't just any Israelites. This letter, as you read through it, assumes a knowledge of just basic, distinctive Christian beliefs. So James is addressing Jews who had come to faith in Jesus as their Messiah. And he obviously views these Jews, these Jewish Christians, as the true remnant of Israel that the prophets often spoke of, that there would be a remnant. And when he says dispersed abroad, the, the word literally is diaspora. You may have heard that word before. Uh, it's speaking of the Jews who were living outside of the Jewish region. So now this makes sense of why there's so much talk about poverty and oppression in this book, because Jews were not looked well upon in the Roman Empire. Pretty much anywhere they went, people did not like the Jews. They were looked down upon. They weren't treated well. And so that's probably why the letter refers often to that kind of poverty and oppression. So anyway, we have this letter now is being written to various groups of Jewish Christians spread around outside their homeland. And we don't know for sure which groups these are, when exactly, probably early, this is probably one of the earliest letters written, probably mid-40s AD. It's probably that it was written to those who were scattered because of the persecution that started with the martyrdom of Stephen and was continued on by Saul before he was converted himself. In fact, Acts chapter 11, verse 19 says, Now those who had been scattered as the result of the persecution that started because of Stephen made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. And it's interesting that the word translated there, scattered, is the verb form of the same word that in James 1 is translated as dispersed abroad. So it's that idea of, of spread out. So these are believers who are uprooted because of this persecution from their homes, from their businesses, and they're having to completely start over in another location. And so I like the way one writer put it. He says, we can imagine James, the leader of the Jerusalem church, sending a pastoral admonition to these believers from his home church that had come from where he was, who had now been scattered abroad because of persecution. Now, this theory cannot be proven, but it does fit remarkably well with the nature and circumstances of the letter. So we can just imagine all these people that had been spread out because of this persecution. Now James is like, hey, look, you're still kind of my church, right? You're, but you're all spread out, so I've got to take care of you. And he writes this letter and, and, and sends it to them. And the overall theme of the letter, as I indicated before, is living out an authentic faith. Of course, most of, many people are familiar with the explicit description of that living out of faith in the well-known passage about faith and works. You know, faith without works is dead. But the entire letter relates to this idea of living out your faith, faith shown externally. A true faith will demonstrate itself in a changed life, a life that follows the pattern of Jesus Christ, the pattern of the one in whom you've placed your faith. So authentic faith, as we'll see, uh, reveals itself, is show itself how you respond to difficulties in life. We're going to talk about that today. It will show in your response to temptations. It will show in your obedience to God's word. It will show in how you treat people, particularly those people who are lowly and vulnerable. Authentic faith will show up in how you talk. It will show up in how you use your money. All of these things we're going to be talking about in this book. So James is basically wisdom literature. It has a lot of similarities to the book of Proverbs. 
It, it has little pithy statements, and it has short little teachings on specific practical areas of life, very similar to Proverbs. But it also has a lot of echoes of the words of Jesus. Uh, even though James may not have believed in Jesus during his eternal life, during, during his earthly life, James off, obviously listened to what Jesus said. There's so many echoes to specific words that Jesus said, particularly the Sermon on the Mount, uh, in this book. So this is going to be a very rich study in the book of James, and it's also going to be a very convicting study. And it's going to touch on a lot of different areas where perhaps as we hear the words of James or the words of God through James, we're going to get a prick of conscience in our lives, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Because that will, as we... We, we should feel the prick of conscience if our faith is real. And if we truly want to live out our faith for God's glory, then we will learn a lot from this book. All right, so with that as our lengthy introduction to, to what the, the, the background of the book, let's start into the first passage. Verses 2 through 4 is what we're going to cover today. But read the passage. This is what it says. Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, Whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Kind of feels like it's starting off in the deep end, doesn't it? And James doesn't start with his thanks to God for the recipients of the letter. He doesn't start off with commendations of the faith of the ones who are receiving his letter. He just jumps right into the teaching. And it's not an easy teaching. It, it meet, but the thing is, it's not an easy teaching, but it meets the readers right where they were. They were dealing with this on a daily basis. They were in the midst of trials. They were probably in poverty. They were probably impression, in oppression. They had all these other things going on. So he meets them right where they're at. And notice he tells us, consider it a great joy whenever you experience various trials. That is the main point of the passage. That is the imperative. Everything else that we're going to talk about in the passage supports that and gives reasons why and how we are to consider trials to be joy. By the way, when it says, consider it joy, joy here does not mean you're getting all giddy and bubbly. The joy he's talking about isn't something superficial. Now, joy is a feeling of happiness, but it's not just that. The joy he's talking about here is more similar to the Jewish concept of shalom. It's a whole person wellness. It's everything is right in my world. It's rooted in the trust in a sovereign God. That's the joy he's talking about. But he's not giving it as an option. Consider it joy as a command. It's something that needs to be obeyed. It's a choice that we must make. It's something that we deliberately do, that we regard it as joy to experience trials. And that's not natural, is it? <laughs> it's not natural at all. Our natural response when we experience trials is not to be positive about it. I mean, it's not pleasant. We don't like it. It hurts. It's not what most people think of as joyful, is it? Actually, more naturally, what we do is we get angry. I don't deserve this. Or we start to feel sorry for ourselves, and we have a little pity party. You see, that is not the response of authentic faith. That's actually showing a lack of faith. When you get angry, you start to feel sorry for yourself, it means that you don't trust God to know what's best for you, or you don't trust his love for you to care for you well enough, or you don't trust his power to carry you through whatever the trial is. Joy in trials is the response of authentic faith. Joy means that you trust God, that he is sovereign over this situation. You trust in his love. You trust in his wisdom. You trust in his power. And so now what we'll see in this text, there's three points in the text that help us consider trials as joy. First, there's just the reality of trials. They're just something you're going to face. The text also speaks of the purpose of trials and also then the end result of trials. And we're going to talk through each one of those. So think of, think of this first, that trials are a reality of life. They will come. James says to consider it joy when you experience trials, not if 
you experience trials. I mean, Christian life is not easy street. It's not all sunshine and roses. Watch out for the so-called preachers who tell you that if you just have enough faith, God's going to bless you with with all kinds of money and, and with health and all that kind of stuff. They are obviously selling something. Listen, trials and difficulties are a given in this life. They don't go away just because you put your faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, they might get worse. Jesus told us to expect trials. John 16, 33, Jesus said to his disciples, you will have suffering or trouble or trials in this world. In fact, if, if think about what happened with Paul when he had the thorn in his flesh. He said, God, please take it away. He said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. The Hebrews 12 passage we read earlier said that if you are children of the Father, then you will have discipline. And actually be more worried if you didn't have discipline because it means you're not a child of the Father. We expect discipline. Trials and difficulties will definitely be a part of your life. There is no escaping it. And they will come in a wide variety of different forms. James says that when you experience various trials. I mean, think about all the ways that we can experience difficulties and trials. It can be big things. It can be like the serious illness or the losing your job or the death of a family member or of a close friend. But it can be smaller things like a customer you're dealing with who's being unreasonable or someone cuts you off on the freeway or you spill something sticky on the kitchen floor. Or, I mean, just you can just imagine all the different things. Now, of course, we're also, to just build out the variety here, we're used to about thinking about trials in the sense of things that are bad, Right? Afflictions and difficulties, those are trials, and that's the main part we're, kind we're going to be talking about today. But don't forget that good things can be trials also, and especially in the sense of things that test our faith. Trials test our faith. We'll get into more of that in a minute, but good things test our faith. In fact, maybe more so than the bad things. In fact, there's a, a quote that's often attributed to Abraham Lincoln, but it actually wasn't spoken by him. It was spoken about him. But it says this, it says, if you want to find out what a man is to the bottom, give him power. Any man can stand adversity, but a, only a great man can stand prosperity. That's true. Prosperity is a test of character. Prosperity is a test of our faith. In fact, prosperity was the test of faith that Israel failed. And Moses actually told them they would. Deuteronomy 8, he said that, he, took, he warned them about this. He told them of the blessings that God would give them in the promised land. He said, be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his commands, ordinances, and statutes that I'm giving you today. When you eat and are full and build beautiful houses to live in and your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold multiply and everything else you have increases, be careful that your heart doesn't become proud and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. So poverty is a trial, but so is wealth. Illness is a trial, but so is health. So trials come in various ways, a wide variety of ways. It would be impossible for us to list all the different ways that you may experience trials, the different ways that our faith is tested, but they are a given. Trials are a given since God has told them, told us that they will come. But he's also told us to have joy. To rejoice like we sang earlier. And since he has told us that trials are given, and he's told us to rejoice, we must have joy in trials. Also, he has promised to be with us in whatever the trial is. So we must consider it a joy. We must consider it an opportunity to witness the grace and the power of God. It's an opportunity for the fruit of the Spirit to grow in us, one of, part of which is joy. So consider it great joy whenever you encounter various trials. But how do we do that? That's the rub, isn't it? How do we do that? How can we consider it joy when we encounter trials? Well, James tells us here that we can do so based on the purpose of trials, what, are they, what they are for. The verse word of verse 3 is because. That tells us a reason for what he has just told us. The reason we consider it joy is because of what they are for. Trials are for the purpose of testing our faith. Now, the word translated as trials here, interestingly, is the same root word as the 
word translated as tempted down in verse 13, which we're going to get to in a couple of weeks. So, but the question I'm just going to address real quick is what's the difference between trials and temptation? Well, the difference is in what they are intended for, the purpose. A trial is an intended as a test of your faith. The word in our verse here translated as testing means the process of determining the genuineness of something or just testing its authenticity. It's kind of like you, you back in that day, they, they, their money was coins, right? So they'd get that silver coin and they'd do a little test on it to make sure it was silver. That's the testing to, pr- to prove its authenticity. A temptation, on the other hand, is intended to cause your faith to fail. It's trying to prove your faith to be false. Now, it's always the case, we'll talk more about that when we get to that passage, but the, we're, the, it's almost always the case, though, that temptations and trials are mixed, right? Because when we're suffering some trial, we are tempted to give up. We are tempted to take the easy way out. We're tempted to cheat. We're tempted to numb our pain with substances or to lash out in anger. Those are the temptations. The temptations are not the same thing as the trial, but they come along with the trial. And on the other, likewise, on the other hand, every temptation is itself a test of faith because it tests whether we trust God enough to obey him. So temptations and trials are pretty much always mixed together. Now, we're not called to take joy in our temptations. We're called to consider our trials to be reasons for joy. Because God brings our trials into our lives for a good purpose, to test our faith with the expectation that it will be proven true. That's what trials are for. Not to undermine our faith, to prove it true. It's kind of like when God told Abraham to offer up his son Isaac on the altar as a sacrifice. This was a test of Abraham's faith. God already knew what his faith was. But it was proof of Abraham's faith. So when it was all said and done, God could say, see that? Your faith is real. Based on that demonstrated faith, now I confirm my promise to you for your many descendants, your land, and all that kind of thing. His faith was proven. We can also consider an, uh, the, uh, compare this James passage to another well-known passage about trials. It's in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. It says, we also boast in our afflictions, or we can say boast in our trials, because we know that affliction produces endurance, and endurance produces proven character. We'll get back to the producing endurance bit in a minute, but notice that afflictions or trials are for the purpose of producing proven character. The trials refine our character. They shape it so that it is proven to be genuine, so that our faith is proven to be authentic. So trials are for our good. And then, so they they test our faith, but not only do they test our faith, they also produce endurance. They train us. They strengthen us. Like the passage that we, again, that we read earlier, Hebrews 12 Verse 7 said, endure suffering, or you could say endure trials, as discipline. Discipline is something that is intended for your good. It's intended to stretch you. It's intended to strengthen you for the future. By the way, that's the difference between punishment and discipline, in case you've ever wondered. Punishment primarily is intended as retribution for something you have done wrong in the past. Discipline is primarily intended to train you to do something right in the future. See the difference? So, now, there's generally a mixture of intent. But the question is, which intent is primary in every given circumstance? Here's an illustration. Because it could be the same action that's going on. What's the intent? Like wind sprints. Everybody know what wind sprints are? It's a form of physical training that can be, for like sports, that can be really painful. Running up and down the, the, the field or the basketball court or whatever it is, and really fast. Intense form of training. It can be really painful. So imagine a team comes in one day to practice, and the coach says, all right, everybody, start running wind sprints until I tell you to stop. And then he tells them that the reason for that was is because he found out that they were hazing their new team member. That's punishment. Now, there may be some side benefit that it's going to make them more fit for their sport, but that's not the intent. The intent is this is punishment because you were hazing your team member. They may come in another day for practice, and they find on the, on the practice agenda of what they're going to be doing, there's like 10 wind sprints on there. It's like, coach, what are you doing? 
I thought we'd, we didn't do anything wrong. He said, no, you didn't do anything wrong, but we've got a game in a couple of weeks, and that's going to make you more uh, fit and be able to keep up the intensity level for the entire game. So yeah, that's the, that intent of that is discipline. That's the difference. So trials are intended as discipline. They are workouts for our faith. They're intended to strengthen our faith and prepare us for the challenges to come. Just like it works with various endurance sports or any kind of sport. You train to build up endurance. A person starts out running one or two miles, then their endurance builds up, they get to where they're running three or four miles, and so on. Eventually, they can keep working at it. They can run a marathon or, or longer. Trials work like that for our faith. They enable us to get through trials in the future that, that are maybe harder, that are tougher. That doesn't make the trials or the difficulties any more pleasant, but it does help us to handle them better. Now, some people might ask, well, why do I want endurance? Can I just stop the trials? I don't, I don't, not, I don't want to run a marathon. Not everybody's crazy enough to run a marathon. Can we just stop with the building endurance and I just not have any more trials? Well, no, because trials were continue. In fact, endurance is a pretty important quality for our Christian faith. We know that trials aren't going to stop. Trials are probably going to get worse. We're going to keep suffering things until Jesus returns. And Jesus himself is the one who says, the one who endures to the end is the one who will be saved. So endurance is pretty important, isn't it? It's actually been said that endurance is faith over the long haul. Endurance is just faith over the long haul. So trials are intended to produce that kind of endurance. Not a passive fatalism kind of endurance, like being a doormat. Rather, endurance that is the kind of active taking hold of the truth of who God is. Tenaciously trusting in God's power and God's goodness and clinging to the hope of God's promises. That kind of endurance is produced by trials. That's the good purpose for trials. That helps us to consider it joy. So the purpose of trials is to test the authenticity of our faith and to produce endurance. And that is pointing towards an ultimate goal. Verse 4, let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. So our trials don't just produce endurance so that we can handle more trials, and then it's just this vicious cycle of endurance, more trials, endurance, more trials. There's a goal that the trials and the endurance are working toward. The end result that trials are for is to make us mature and complete. It does say we have to respond to this. We need to allow the trials to do this work in us. Now, the the word translated here, by the way, is full, as in full effect. And the word translated mature, a little bit after that, are the same root word in Greek. Uh, the different translations in the English actually somewhat hides the wordplay that James uh, intended here. This word is often translated as perfect, so one way we could say it to make it sound, uh, get the wordplay he was intending is, let endurance have its perfect effect so that you will be perfect. Of course, perfect actually probably isn't the best translation. The, the, the noun form of the Greek root, root word here is telos, it means a design or a purpose or a goal, right? So the adjective form here in this verse means to have achieved that design or that purpose. So when it says perfect, it just doesn't mean like perfect in the sense of blameless. Well, that is the ultimate goal, I guess, in, in the, when Jesus comes back. But right now, it's that idea of having fulfilled the purpose. Mature, complete, fully developed, Achieving the purpose to it for which we were designed. It describes something that has fulfilled the purpose for which it was made. It meets the design specification. So we're instructed to have, uh, to allow endurance to have its full intended effect. In other words, don't fight it. Let it do what it's supposed to do. And the effect is that it will come to, mer- to maturity. We would fill out the purpose for which we were designed. What, what, what is our design? Our design is to be God's image bearers. In other words, we are to be loyal worshipers, servants of God who act on his behalf and for his glory on the earth. That's what we were created for. That is our design. And so our trials, as they test us, as they produce endurance 
in us are shaping us to be what we were designed to be. Shaping us to be loyal worshipers, servants of God, bearing his image. This is talking about the process of sanctification. If you haven't, uh, aren't familiar with that word, sanctification is the big theological word that we used to talk about, the process by which a Christian becomes more and more holy. See, when we put our faith in Jesus, when we're adopted into God's family, God takes us however we are. But he doesn't leave us how we were. A person might be as messed up as you can imagine when they become a follower of Christ. They could be a pagan idolater, a murderer, a fornicator, you know, you name it. But the moment they are given new life in Christ, their desires change. They repent of the things they once did. It's kind of like what Paul commented to the Corinthians. He, he lists all these kinds of sex, uh, or immor- sinful people. He says, like, sexual immoral people, idolaters, homosexuals, thieves, drunkards, abusers, swindlers. He says, all these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. They won't get to be a part of it. But verse 11, some of you used to be like this. That's how you used to be. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. See, people who put their saving faith in Jesus Christ, they change. It doesn't change overnight. Their lifestyle doesn't change immediately. Habits have been formed in the past. Sin has its claws deeply embedded in people. So they don't change overnight. But if it is authentic faith, their lives will change. They will increasingly choose against gratifying their sinful desires. They will more and more obey God's word. They will more and more live for his glory. That is the process of sanctification. It is a process of transformation. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that we all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and being transformed into that same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. So we were made in the image of God but that image was disfigured. It was, it was damaged by sin. And sin, sanctification is the process of restoring to perfection that image of God that we were designed to bear. And Romans 8 says it this way, that the end goal of our being called and our being justified, in other words, us, the end goal of us being saved, is that we would be ultimately conformed to the image of God's Son. God's son was the perfect man and the perfect image of the father. So in other words, that we would be mature, that we would be complete, lacking nothing, as what James says here. And so that's the the process of sanctification, and one of the primary tools that God uses to sanctify us, to conform us to the image of Christ, is trials. That's what they're for. In Acts 14, we see Paul and Barnabas going back through and visiting the churches they planted. In verse 22, it says they were, strengthened by, they were strengthening the disciples by encouraging them to continue in the faith and by telling them it is necessary to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. It is necessary to go through hardships. That is how we get into the kingdom of God. That is how we are shaped into citizens of God's kingdom. As an illustration, each one of us is like a block of stone. No, I didn't say you're all blockheads. This is an illustration. We are each like a block of stone, and the image of God is in there somewhere. And trials are like the chisel in the hand of God as a master sculptor. He chips away all those things that are obscuring that image of God in us. He knocks off the corners. He he shaves off the rough edges. And in the end... Each person in Christ will be a masterpiece. God has promised that he'll finish this work too. He's not going to leave it halfway done. First, uh, Philippians 1.6 says, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. See, he's doing that work in us, but that work cannot be done without a chisel. It cannot be done without trials. So trials have a very important purpose in our lives. Listen, I know that trials are not pleasant. Trials don't feel good. But we can rejoice knowing that God is in control of every one of those trials, every one of those difficulties. They cannot come into our lives unless God permits it. 
They cannot be one iota worse or, or more difficult than God allows. And for every challenge that you face, for every sorrow, every grief, every pain, God has a perfect purpose. That is something to rejoice in. And it's like the passage in Hebrews 12, again, that we read earlier, verse 11. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. That is true. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. That's the purpose. We're not told to rejoice in the pain of the trial. It's not the pain, it's not the sorrow that give us joy. We rejoice in the purpose of the trial. We rejoice in what the trial is doing in our lives. Each trial is intended to strengthen your faith just a little bit more, to make you a little more holy, to make you a little more like Christ. When I was in seminary, our dean of students was known for saying a, a certain thing when a student was sort of complaining about a difficult test that was coming up or a long paper that he had to write or something like that. Our dean of students would say something like, well, isn't that great? Another opportunity for sanctification. And the student would probably roll his eyes. But it was true. Each trial is an opportunity for our sanctification to be growing more like Christ. We can rejoice in difficulties when we recognize that each one takes us one step closer to being like Jesus Christ. And as we progress, as we see changes going on in our life, we can rejoice because that is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. Because it is the Holy Spirit who produces those changes in us, working with those trials to bring about changes in our lives. And when we see our progress in holiness and in character... It's the Spirit who's bringing about those changes. And knowing that that's happening, of course, our progress in, in holiness and character is a joy in its own right. But if, when we see the Holy Spirit causing these changes, it shows to us that our faith is authentic, that it's real faith, it's vibrant faith. It shows us that God loves us because he has given us his Spirit who is bringing about these changes in us. My friends, never think that if you're going through some challenge that it means that God doesn't love you. That is never the case. Actually, if you're going through some challenge, it's evidence that God does love you. Because as a father, he disciplines the son or the daughter that he loves. So consider it joy, my brothers and sisters, when you experience various trials. They prove the authenticity of your faith. They build your endurance so that you can make it to the end, and they bring you closer to the goal of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, this is a difficult teaching to rejoice in trials. But Lord, when we think about what you intend those trials to do, that you are in sovereign control of them, and you have a perfect purpose for our good, to shape us into the people that you want us to be, to conform us to the image of Christ, we keep that foremost in our minds, Lord, we can rejoice, because you are doing a great work in us, and we thank you for it. Help us, Lord, to cooperate with that work, to allow endurance to have its full effect. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to see those changes as they take place, and to rejoice even more as we come closer and closer to the likeness of Christ. We pray all these things in his name and for his glory. Amen.